neighborhoods have their own cultures, their own vibe. These neighborhoods have all of these different wonderful things that make them unique. And that's what we need to celebrate. And that's why it's a priority of the city of Cape Girardeau is to really get these neighborhood organizations up and running so that each individual neighborhood can celebrate itself and can advocate for itself and can work towards the betterment of the neighborhood. And that's what's so fun about this conversation, because not only can I talk about the, my position with city council, I can talk about the Red Star neighborhood. We're a wonderful neighborhood north of the casino in downtown Cape Girardeau. We've got beautiful views of the Mississippi River. We've got the only Mississippi River uh, boat access in Cape Girardeau. And so we have all these wonderful natural assets. And those natural assets are what set us apart and what made us a perfect neighborhood to come together as a neighborhood development initiative. And then also as our own individual 501c3 organization. Now, COVID-19 has obviously changed a lot of our meeting schedule. We do not get to meet regularly. We used to have meetings every single month in the Red Star Baptist Church. And now that has changed because we don't wanna get anybody sick and we don't want there to be any community spread based on our own community in Red Star, but we do stay connected. And that's what's important about these neighborhoods is that you have your neighbors, you talk to your neighbors, you call them, you, you talk, you know, whenever you're pulling in your trash cans, you do all of these different things. And that's what we do still in Red Star is we call each other, we talk to each other, we send Facebook messages. And so there's all kinds of ways that you can get involved in your neighborhood. And there's all of these really wonderful ways that you can celebrate your neighborhood and then also work to make your neighborhoods better through a neighborhood development initiative. Um, in Red Star, uh, we've had some ups and downs. We've obviously had some issues whenever it comes to uh, just some of the little things that plague any neighborhood in the city of Cape Girardeau. But what we've been able to do is really work with landlords, work with homeowners, beef up people's uh, person or pr personal pride in their property to make sure that everybody's moving forward in a positive direction. And that's what a neighborhood development and a good neighborhood development association really does is, is move the entire community forward in that positive way. Um, and so I'm here to answer any questions about the Red Star Neighborhood Association. I'm here to make sure that anybody has any questions about how we, uh, we do what we do, uh, how we've gotten to where, we're, where we are with our, the information we know about our neighborhood, the statistics, the demographics, all of these different things. Um, so we have a lot to celebrate in Red Star and there's a lot of a, a very wonderful future uh, for the Red Star neighborhood in Cape Girardeau. And I'm just excited to be a part of it and excited to be a part of the ride going forward. Thank you, Councilman. Purple Couch, let's hear from you. Well, um, Dan pretty much said everything I was going to say about the entire city. So uh, he's, uh, he's, he's laid out a great foundation for me. Uh, my name is Rich <clears throat> Couch with the Cape Girardeau Police Department. I am a, am a community service officer. And my primary task is to build relationships and solve problems within the community that are a bit too time intensive for the regular patrol officer. The Cape Girardeau Police Department has several programs that the public may not be aware of. And some of these are stuff that, that Dan kind of touched upon. One, the crime-free multi-housing program. This program is geared towards property owners and property managers, and that teaches them how to reduce incidents of crime on their property. Uh, the program goals are pretty simple. Like we want to create a safer apartment community. We want to facilitate a cooperative effort between the property owner, management, and police to in an effort to minimize crime. Help apartment owners and managers more effectively learn how to, to legally screen their tenants and, and do what's right in, in that regard. Show residents crime prevention techniques to maintain a safe and secure home, not only for the tenant, for the resident, for the property owner themselves, and facilitate a better understanding of the use of residential tenancy laws. That is a super gray area as Ryan uh, knows quite well and uh, oftentimes we get calls all the time on can as, as a landlord can I do this as a property owner can I do this well knowing those those things uh, only helps to, to benefit your property and benefit the community as a whole and then ultimately reduce the number of criminal and nuisance complaints related to incidents at apartment communities we deal with a lot of uh, problems in the city because that's our job and a lot of the problems that we deal with are primarily on rental dwellings on rental property. So it's really good to kind of reach out to those people and be on the same page as those property managers and those property owners so we can all work to collectively to um, have a better community and a better way of life. Uh, these programs consist of three phases, training the management, obviously, property and security assessment by me, and then just training of the residents and letting them know that, hey, here's what the property manager wants to see from now on. Um, here's what we're willing to do as a police department. And we all have to work together to uh, make the the property a better place. 
Currently, there are several properties going through the program. However, there's only one property in the city as of right now that's an actual certified crime-free multi-housing property. And so uh, there's a lot that are working on it. There's a lot of things that go into it besides just saying that, okay, we, we've got rid of the crime. And uh, because we want to make sure that the property owners are serious about moving forward in the right way, in the right direction. Uh, another program is the crisis intervention team. Every officer in the city of Cape is a crisis intervention team uh, trained officer, meaning that we are trained to recognize those with mental illness and we are instructed on how to handle those experiencing various forms of mental illness. Additionally, a social worker from community counseling and an officer will follow up on a weekly basis with those who have been reported as having a mental illness crisis. In 2020, the CGPD took 136 CIT reports and um, we followed up on those and got people the help that they needed. As of October 1st, the CGPD further instituted a mental illness screening process upon the intake at the Cape Girardeau Municipal Jail, meaning that um, we screened everybody that came through here since October 1st and 64 individuals were referred to a counselor for follow-up to get the help that they needed in that regard. So good things are happening on that end as well. Uh, SEPTED, Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design. Um, one of the things uh, we offer as well as our crime-free multi-housing program is the crime prevention through environmental design, meaning that we can assist property owners, we can assist um, builders with learning how to design their property that makes it less attractive for criminal elements, criminal property or criminal uh, behavior on their property. Better lighting, um, just sometimes the way, the way the structure's constructed, eliminating hiding spots, uh, landscaping, things of that nature. And we can offer that information to them at the time that they're starting to design their property and thus on the back end, making it much easier uh, for everybody involved to not be a victim of crime. One of the big things we're dealing with right now, as everybody in the city of Cape knows, is homelessness. Our homeless uh, assistance and outreach has really um, blossomed with our good relationships with various organizations in the city. Um, currently, the CGPD is partnered with several churches, Catholic Charities of Southeast Missouri, Connections, and Community Partnerships of SEMO. Um, presently, Community Partnerships has approximately 34 people for homeless prioritization. By definition, these people are sleeping in places not meant for human habitation, living in homeless shelters or other institutions, as well as maybe fleeing domestic violence. Since May of 2020, uh, to date, Community Partnerships has successfully housed an additional nine formerly homeless households, totaling 37 individuals. During the same time frame, through homelessness prevention funding, they have been able to prevent the possibility of homelessness for over 67 households, which equates to 122 people. So as you can see, good things are happening in that regard. Um, all of our officers have been educated on where, where we can send people for resources. As we all know, last week was a horrible weather week, and uh, we spent a lot of our time going around and making sure people knew that there was warm places to go, knew that there were, there were uh, hotel rooms available if need be. And trust me, there's a couple that I just pretty much had to beg to, hey, it's going to be negative 10 tomorrow. Would you please, for my sake, go sleep somewhere warm just so I can sleep better at night, knowing that you're okay. So we, although we have limited resources in the city of Cape, there are always avenues of assistance for those in need. And uh, we are not unlike any other city in, in the nation, is that we are experiencing a wave of homelessness pretty much like we've never seen before. And uh, there are some resources out there, and we can get those people the help they need. Uh, one of the things that Nicolette made sure I wanted to, I was going to speak about is chronic nuisance properties and chronic nuisance parties. Two different things, still a nuisance if you ask me. Uh, unfortunately, in the city of Cape, we experience our share of chronic nuisance properties. These properties are defined in Municipal Ordinance 17-300. They involve the illegal use or possession or manufacturing of drugs, illegal possession or use of firearms, prostitution, consumption of alcohol under proper age, offenses against public order in chapter 17, noise violations and such, and then assaults. Three reported incidents of the above 12, in the above 12 months may get a property deemed as a chronic nuisance property. One report of illegal drug usage or firearms usage will um, pretty much get you straight on the chronic nuisance property list because we don't want illegal drug use on any property or obviously guns being fired off as we commonly get on a daily basis. So we're working on that. Uh, contrary to that, chronic nuisance properties, CMO students are back in action, and we, when CMO students, unfortunately, Dan, are back in action, 
we do have some chronic nuisance parties from time to time. Those include 10 plus people at any given place, uh, unlawful sale or, or use of alcohol, violation of any noise ordinance, fighting, property damage, littering, the always fun out, outdoor urination, and the standing or parking of vehicles that obstructs traffic. Uh, any conduct that threatens to injury the persons or damage other property, unlawful use of possession of marijuana, trespassing or indecent exposure. So with CMO back in town, sometimes we have some parties. Everybody likes to enjoy themselves and we want them to do that. But we want them to be respectful of their neighbors and to be conscious that, uh, hey, blocking the street with 500 cars in, in the 1400 block of Whitener can't happen. And uh, we work with those young folks to educate them and make sure they're safe and, and do what they're supposed to do. So in, con in conclusion, the CGPD wants to do everything it can to ensure peace and safety in our community. If you have any issues or concerns, please don't hesitate to contact us, 335-6621, me directly at extension 1243. Thanks. Thank you, Corporal. Ryan, let's hear from you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ryan Shrumplin. I am the city planner and I work in the community development department at City Hall. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about property maintenance and dangerous buildings, uh, which are also known as the condemnation program. Um, I want to start with the basis for our laws. Um, if you're not familiar with our code, it is available online at the city's website. Um, but we have our code of ordinances and chapter seven of the city code contains the city's regulations for buildings. Um, now that's a pretty broad chapter. It includes all of our building codes, fire codes, uh, all the different uh, mechanical plumbing, uh, electrical codes, but it also includes the property maintenance code. And so for each of these codes, the city adopts a uh, nationally prepared uh, code. Um, most communities now are using what are called the international codes. They're created uh, and issued by the International Code Council. And so they're all called the International Family of Codes. Uh, for property maintenance, the city has adopted the 2015 version of the International Property Maintenance Code, uh, or IPMC for short. And we do have some local amendments, so it's not an exact copy of that code, uh, but for the most part, that is the code that we use. Um, and according to the uh, International Code Council's website, the IPMC contains minimum maintenance standards for basic equipment, light, ventilation, sanitation, and fire safety. Uh, so the city's version of the uh, International Property Maintenance Code is enforced by the Inspection Services Division, which is in the Community Development Department. Uh, that division has an inspector that investigates uh, alleged property maintenance violations. So if they find a viol violation, then the, the inspector sends a letter to the property owner giving them a specified time frame to cure or to end the violation. Now, if the violation is not cured after the deadline, then the property owner can be cited and ultimately prosecuted. Um, sometimes a building is so dilapidated that it has to be condemned. Um, that's where the city's dangerous buildings uh, ordinance comes in. Uh, the dangerous building ordinance is also in chapter seven of the city code, and it lays out a process for repairing or demolishing a condemned building. Uh, condemned meaning a building that is unfit for use or occupancy. So the condemnation process contains multiple steps. It includes sending a notice to the property owner, uh, holding a hearing, and ultimately issuing an order to either repair or demolish the building within a specified time frame. So after the time frame, if that uh, owner is uncooperative or unresponsive, then the city has the legal authority to hire a contractor to demolish the building and tax bill the property owner, uh, which constitutes a lien on the property. Now, both property maintenance and condemnation, they address only building violations. Um, so if you're talking about, you know, weeds or animals or things like that that aren't specific to a building, those are handled by the city's nuisance abatement officer. So that's a different group and a different uh, enforcement process. Um, but for both property maintenance and for condemnation, you know, I did want to point out that these are last resort options as far as prosecution. We really don't want to go to that extent. We would much prefer to work with a property owner. Uh, so as long as they're responsive and they're showing some evidence of, of a willingness to work with us, um, we don't want to go to those those steps. So it's very important that you know violations get identified early, and that the property owners made aware of it, and that they make some attempt to work with the city uh, to address the issue. And uh, that that segues into the other part I'm going to talk about, which is the neighborhood development initiative. Dan already uh, touched on quite a bit of this, but. 
Uh, the Neighborhood Development Initiative uh, was a program. It's a program that was created uh, in response to a citizen survey that was conducted in 2012. And the results of that survey showed that there is a major concern for neighborhoods uh, in the areas of crime, vacancies, and deteriorating properties. So uh, the city manager launched this, uh, what we call the NDI program, uh, to address these and other issues by providing information and resources to assist neighborhoods with bringing about positive change. It's a citizen-based program that's facilitated by the city. And uh, NDI relies on those who live, work, and play in our neighborhoods to work together with their neighbors and the city to discuss issues, learn from each other, and to formulate strategies for taking action. So the ultimate goal of NDI is to strengthen our neighborhoods by making them safer, more attractive, and more active. So as part of this process, neighbors receive guidance on how to engage the city in addressing these issues. Uh, neighbors also learn about what they can do to create an environment that discourages crime and deterioration as uh, Officer Couch uh, talked about, uh, and also uh, learn about ways to promote a sense of community. So in order to participate in this program, uh, you have to form a neighborhood association. It doesn't have to be a formal nonprofit, the Red Star Group is, but it doesn't have to be um, to participate in the program. But you do have to have a collective group uh, that meets on a regular basis uh, with a city staff liaison to uh, kind of discuss the issues, discuss uh, strategies, and uh, just anything else they want to accomplish. So the neighbor association um, are encouraged to work with residents and property owners to resolve issues because it expands and strengthens relationships and it avoids those steps of prosecution and condemnation that I talked about earlier. So that's it. Okay, so I'm gonna challenge Corporal Couch and Mr. Trimplin here with a question. Uh, from the Red Star Neighborhood Association, whenever we do get together, we often talk about those houses every neighborhood every street every every part of this community has what all of the neighbors consider to be that house it's the house that you know has an issue the house that you you suspect might have be dealing drugs it's the house that's got the constant nuisance nuisance issue because it's a there's a landlord that owns it that doesn't even live in this state what does a citizen do to to help their community overcome the challenges proposed by these singular places of, of residence that just cause issue for the entire entire neighborhood well i, I think it takes a multi-pronged approach in that type of situation <laughs> if you have an absentee owner that makes it much more challenging uh, especially to try to accomplish something locally in terms of a neighborhood uh, if you don't know how to reach the owner there's there's simply no way really for a neighborhood to um facilitate you know addressing the issues on that property so in that case it, it may actually require the city to to do some investigation um and you know like i said community development our department works very closely and very well with the police department so uh, there may be multiple violations on a property and as i mentioned earlier some of those may fall under nuisance some of those may actually categorize the property as a potential chronic nuisance um, so we work as a team on that. The departments work very closely to uh, gather and share information and to talk about, um, you know, how we can uh, really work together to, you know, uh, remedy this property. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's, it's not an easy process. We've gone through that before where the property owners uh, all but non-existent and it takes a lot of digging and it takes a lot of effort on everyone's part to, um, to remedy the problem. One of the biggest suggestions I would say is having a neighborhood group that is concerned, first of all, that says, hey, we don't want this in our neighborhood, whether it's drug sales, whether it's prostitution, whether it's just unkept properties, and then bringing that to our attention and, and we can start that ball rolling. And it's a difficult time if, if we don't know where the property owner is or how to get a hold of them, but it can happen. We've proven this time and time again in the past that it will take a while. It's not gonna be something that happens next week. And that's one of the, the issues I run into quite frequently is people say, well, I told you about this last Monday and here it is Monday. And I'm like, well, I still yet to figure out who the guy is that owns this property. And so once we do that and we start holding that property owner's feet to the fire to some degree, that helps out tremendously. And uh, you know, it, it, the more people we have complaining about a problem, the more likely it is to be heard and heard a little quicker. And we experienced that in, a, in an area um, on north henderson and um you know it was everybody up and down the street like this has got to stop and it took a while and it's still in the process to some degree 
and it's it's a very uh, painstaking process. But it is it is very fortunate that we have such a great working relationship with with the city officials and us and nuisance and and everybody had their hand in the cookie jar in, in that regard and and just kind of helping every taking it every angle that we could and so uh yeah it's 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 fun for sure <laughs> so how what do you guys recommend that a neighbor a neighborhood or a neighbor do if they suspect there is um there there's something to deal with drugs happening in one of those those houses what, call what do you me recommend? Call. Yeah, well, I want them to call me and just let's have a chat. Let's find out what's going on. Um, start sending me information. Start what whatever. We had one, a call just about a half an hour ago of a suspicious vehicle parked in a neighborhood where a lady was scared to go out and check her mail because this vehicle had been sitting there all morning. So officers went by, checked them out, find out what they're doing there. And uh, that's the same thing. And a lot of times, if, if the same thing with crime-free multi-housing, if we have property owners that take a concerted effort and say we are not going to tolerate criminal behavior in our in our area then guess what those criminals will go elsewhere because they are looking for an easy way to do their drugs to do their drug sales do whatever they do to make a buck and if they know that they can pull on your street and they're going to be reported to the police within the first five minutes of sitting on the side of the road guess what they're going to go elsewhere and if we all do that collectively then guess what Cape is a much better place for it. So that's one of the things I cannot stress enough. If you if if you see something, say something. That's that's a phrase coined by the Department of Homeland Security, but it works for us as well. If you see something strange, it probably is. People usually don't sit out in front of your house for five hours at a time without visiting someone, going up to your door or whomever, or knocking on your door and asking if they can come in and shampoo your carpets or rake snow on a shovel snow on a day like today. So. Uh, you know, you have to be mindful. If it looks if it looks weird, then it probably is, and call us, and we'll look into it. That's great advice. Yeah, and it looks like we had a, someone in the chat actually said to just contact the city. You know, like you were saying before, have your neighbors call, have your neighbors' neighbors call, call yourself, uh, contact your city council member, do what you have to do in order to make sure that you feel comfortable and safe in your in your neighborhood. Well, and and I've I've always been, especially if that's a rental property, I'm cool with calling the property owner himself and saying, hey, guess what? Your property has become kind of a nuisance in the area. Would you like to take care of it? Because you have a little bit more authority than we do actually, or would you like us to take care of it? Because if we take care of it and it gets deemed a chronic nuisance property and it goes through the all the entire channels, it can be shut down for up to a year. And nine times out of 10, they're like, nope, I'll make a phone call here momentarily. And if you have further problems, please contact me and we'll get it addressed to me. And usually, knock on wood, the, the problem goes away. Exactly. And, and also Cape keep Girardo, in mind that the, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, Cape Girardeau is a community where we have over 700 landlords. Those are landlords that own multiple properties, landlords that own one property. And so we are a town that has a lot of landlords. And so if those landlords live locally or if they live in Florida, you still need to contact your council member, your police office, your uh, your city hall in order to make sure you that they, those landlords know about the issues that are taking place on their properties. Excellent. I wanted to point out that the uh, city requires a license to be a landlord. So um, ultimately, you know, if we have an issue with a, with a landlord that isn't addressing these issues, you know, their license could be revoked. So in addition to all the other uh, tools that we have to, uh, you know, try to get com compliance, you know, the landlord licensing is a powerful one. So if you do know that a property is being rented out uh, and you suspect there's some activity or you know there's some activity that doesn't meet the, the city laws, you know, check to find out if they even have their landlord license, if they're required to have one, if they have one, uh, and if they don't, that's an issue right there. But even if they do, um, you know, that should give them some incentive to uh, work with us. So if anybody takes anything away from this webinar today, I hope it was, if you see something, say something. That's so, so important because there are so many wonderful services. Which is actually a nice segue to Johnny's question here on the Facebook chatter. Um, he's asking um, about some South Side homes that have broken in doors or windows and have for the greater part of a year. So he didn't specify, but that suggests that maybe somebody has already said something. And I think you guys have touched on a couple of reasons why that might be an issue. But um, Ryan, I don't know if you want to field that one first. Can a property have 
broken windows and doors for an extended period of time, and what do we do about that? Uh, no, no, the code does not allow windows, <clears throat> windows and doors to be broken. They have to be properly functioning. Um, you know, sometimes people leave their doors open, their, wind, their windows open, and you know, some folks wouldn't do that because they wouldn't feel secure doing that. So we have to be careful and make sure that, you know, there is in fact damage there, uh, or if the property appears to be abandoned, you know, and it's not secured, uh, we certainly want to get the police involved so that they can go in and, and see uh, if you've got squatters or, you know, animals doing damage or anything like that. And then what, what we ultimately do is once we go through and make sure hey, it's an abandoned property and there are no squatters, or if there are, we've, we've asked them to relocate, uh, then we contact inspections and have inspections go over there and, and do an assessment and then start their process. So every, every, every chain has a link to some degree. And so, uh, yeah, it's just kind of part of it. If that person can email me those addresses, I'll be happy to forward that on and uh, we'll take care of it. We'll, we'll follow up with uh, with Johnny with a direct message to that effect in case he uh, had to sign off at, at this point. Um, we actually have another elected official on the call. I didn't realize it's not just uh, Ward 1's Dan Preston here on the webinar, but we also have our uh, Commissioner Charlie Hurst, who represents the city on the county commission level. Um, and he just wanted to say nice job, guys, and, and thank you for the, uh, the remedy to some nuisances on some North Henderson uh, properties. I just wanted to extend that. Um, we also got a question about um, regarding the uh, uh, property design um, for security that you were talking about, Corporal. Is there a yes. service that, that we or someone else maybe offers to look at existing homes or businesses to tell them and advise them on how to fortify the security of their existing property? Or who would you recommend that they, they speak to about that? Absolutely. They can contact me and we can set something up. I, I do that quite frequently for existing businesses as well. And it's just something just kind of a heads up. We'll do a quick little survey and kind of offer some suggestions on how they can uh, be a harder target regarding the criminal element. And uh, it usually works really well. So uh, just have them feel free to email me and uh, I'll take care of it. Well, we hope you get a couple extra emails after this call because uh, that's a great service. Uh, Ryan, this one might be for you from Patty on Facebook. She had a question about hazardous trees. If there is a tree that is not on a homeowner's uh, property, but they deem that as a potential hazard to them and their property, is there any recourse? What should they do? Um, so the, the tree is actually on the neighbor's property, but it's overhanging into their yard. Is that correct? Yeah, or have some, okay. some for some reason been deemed a threat to them. Uh, she did not specify. Okay. Generally, that's a private matter. I'd encourage the homeowner to work with the neighbor to try to resolve that amicably. Um, I will point out that, you know, Ameren has a lot of easements along property lines. So if you have a tree crossing a property line, you might contact Ameren to see uh, if they would come out and trim the trees in their easement. They have the right to do that. Um, and they do that on a regular basis in, in several areas of the city. Uh, and of course, they do send a notice to the property owners in, in advance. But um, if, if that tree is crossing through an Ameren easement for power lines or for whatever, they, uh, they may actually come out and just trim all the trees along that property line. Nicolette, any additional questions? Sorry about that. I was talking away on mute, folks. I apologize. I was telling folks it's the last call for questions. We have one more, so go ahead and drop something in Facebook or Zoom if you have one more thing. The last question we got, if someone does not already have a formal neighborhood organization um, in their neighborhood to reach out for the NDI program, what do you recommend being that first step that they should do to take action? Dan, you want to take that one? Well, actually, I was going to pitch that over to Ryan. Ryan, what would you recommend from the city perspective to get that rolling? Uh, well, first, you know, they, they should contact me. We can talk some more about uh, the neighborhood and kind of what, what kind of issues they're dealing with and what they want to accomplish. But I think it would be really good if they are, in fact, serious about that to actually talk to Councilman Preston and uh, kind of have him expand on some of the information that he shared uh, today. Um, just so they can get a, a really good understanding of what's involved with forming a neighborhood association and kind of, you know, what happens on a regular basis and, and what kind of things um, that you encounter and, and how do you how do you fulfill those those goals. Yeah, Nicolette, if you would have if you'd send that, that person uh, my email address, I'd love to talk to him about that. Can do, can do. 
All right, folks, any other final uh, comments or questions? Uh, not seeing any. Um, I just wanted to remind folks, if you're still with us, that um, our next um, event is March 8th, and we're talking about keeping Cape safe, the policymaker perspective on public safety with City Manager Scott Meyer and Councilwoman Shannon Cruxel. Thank you to our panelists today. Thank you to our guests online, and you all stay safe. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye, Thank everybody. you. Goodbye. Bye.